Yeah, okay. So uh, really a distinct pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, uh, uh, our lecturer, our lecturer, Professor Kendall. Um, I was just thinking, you know, that uh, science, scientific research is about the future, but also about who has made the big uh, foundational progressive uh, uh, discoveries, uh, not in the past, but the immediate past. And, uh, and this time, you know, we're having breakfast today. I was with the lecturers, and then we're, look, we're just reviewing about the progress. You know, in the 1970s, before I think most of you were born, some of you, right? And in the 1970s, there are several giants which came out uh, in, in the combustion community. And one of them is Professor Kendall. And that uh, I always think he's here and now we're we buddies. So the, he graduated, he, he's the giant, I'm, I'm not, okay. But he graduated in 72 and I graduated in 73. And uh, it was heady days, really exciting, that uh, energy crisis and all that. And uh, a lot of good research. And so, uh, so Professor Kandel has made uh, really just uh, outstanding progress in combustion dynamics, flame dynamics, and you see that today. And, uh, and all these years, he made contributions, of course, in flame dynamics, but also in terms of the governance or something. I mean, this guy, eventually, he became the president of the French Academy of Science. Can you imagine? Academy of Science. He got our combustion in the map, because other those science, science guys, they think combustion is more applied, right? But he is the president of the French Academy of Science. So I always brag about it, so that because I say we are buddies, so so I, I feel good too. <laughs> You're not the president. Yeah, no, 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 I'm, I'm not. I, I, <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I'm a great admirer of his work and and his person. When I select the lecturers, not only for their technical ability, what they done, their also their insight, and also their per person, I think. That to be a person, it's it's very important, you know. And then you see how 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 he gives the lecture, how he looks at things, not only scientifically but but just in general. And that's what I really hope. What I really hope that you guys will continue the, the this this very nice scholarly scientific way of looking at problems. Okay, all right, enjoy. Yeah. And uh, thank you very much for this very nice introduction. I don't know if I deserve it, oh, yeah, but uh, I'll try my best to, uh, to be at the level of your expectations. Uh, I, wh what I was wanting to say also is that uh, I had the pleasure of being the uh, vice president of the Combustion Institute while Ed was the president. So uh, uh, he was an excellent president. He did a lot for the Combustion Institute and uh, of course the Combustion Institute uh, always uh, is a very helpful institution, very important for us. So I think uh, he was a good example of uh, a president. All right, so uh, I, I should also uh, mention that my term as a president of the Academy of Science in France is now terminated. I've, uh, I've done my, my job, so now I'm more relaxed, in a sense, uh, for uh, two years vice president, two years president, you, you work a lot. The president always works very hard, so uh, uh, now it's vacation time for me. <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, the topic here is combustion dynamics. Uh, uh, I, I want to... Uh, tell you uh, about the work that has been done, especially the work that we have carried out uh, in this field. Uh, just this slide to mention again uh, Ed Law uh, and also uh, indicate that I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I was here three years ago and uh, this is uh, one more time. It's beautiful to be in Princeton and, uh, and be with you and share ideas and uh, and tell you about uh, this sort of uh, topic. Uh, also, the, uh, so the, the focus is combustion dynamics. And we will look at that uh, from the experimental, theoretical, numerical point of view. We will look at many experiments. We'll do uh, calculations. Uh, we want to look at the basics. And we want to also look at the applications. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, of course, we, I had many students uh, in this field. Uh, some of them are quite successful now. Uh, for example, Nicolas Noiret, uh, last, uh, at the last symposium, got a Tsuji uh, Young uh, Scientist Award or something, and he's a, a professor at ETH in, in, in Zurich. And uh, uh, we have uh, a number of associates. Currently, our, my student is uh, Guillaume Vignat, and, uh, and he's doing very well. And uh, we had a number of uh, postdoctoral fellows and students. And, and of course, we work with them. Uh, this research cannot be done if you are just by yourself. Your research, in fact, is a, a collective uh, undertaking. And uh, this is how we see it. And, uh, everybody brings his own uh, uh, knowledge and understanding to a joint effort. All right, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the school. Uh, I'm, uh, I've been a professor at a place called Ecole Centrale Paris. Now this school, Ecole Centrale, has merged with another school called Supelec, and this has become Centrale Supelec. And this, uh, this school uh, gives about 800 degrees, engineering degrees per year. So it's a reasonable size school. Initially, we were in the blue place down there. You see Paris, and it's outside Paris on the south, not far from Orly Airport. And now we moved completely, so everything has moved, and we are now, now close to Orsay, in the red circle there. And it's not far from Paris. It's, uh, uh, you see the traffic is green everywhere, but this is uh, uh, in the night, you know. <laughs> During the day, it, it doesn't look like that. Uh, so we are in Orsay, and uh, we are building a university which is called Université Paris-Saclay. This is the, a new university, 50,000 students, and we are just part of that. So Centrale Supélec is part of that. What you see here is some of our alumni. I mean, uh, the older ones. Eiffel, who built the Eiffel Tower, came from Ecole Centrale Paris. He got his engineering degree from Ecole Centrale Paris. And you know that Eiffel, at the age of 70, uh, he had built all these towers, bridges, uh, everything. And he decided that uh, uh, aeronautics was interesting. It was uh, uh, just after the flight of the Wright brothers in 1903. And he started doing experiments on the, in wind tunnels. He built an open wind tunnel. Uh, in fact, we call those Eiffel wind tunnels. And uh, he started looking at the resistance of aircraft to, to flight, you know, uh, the drag. What, what is the drag for aircraft? What is the drag of spheres? St he started by dropping spheres from the Eiffel Tower, but that was not very precise. So he built these uh, wind tunnels and continued, and he did a very nice piece of research on the aerodynamics of profiles of aircraft, uh, lift and drag, and uh, all of uh, what, what is around uh, uh, aircraft aerodynamics. Uh, and, uh, and later on, in 1917, he got the second Langley Medal from the United States. So in, uh, in, uh, in reference of his very nice work in this field. Uh, another person who came out of our school is Constantin Rosanov. In 1947, you know that uh, the sound barrier was broken by an aircraft. And who was the pilot? Chuck Yeager. He's still alive, I think. And uh, in 1954, in France, on a French aircraft, Constantin Rosanov also broke the sound barrier. So, just a few years after, uh, after Chuck Yeager, we have also, and, and he, was a, he was an engineer from our school. And this shows the lab at one point uh, during our uh, work. That, that was still in Chateau Malabry, but uh, we now have a, a different location. So this uh, just tells you a little bit of uh, aircraft. Uh, so in uh, 1903, we have this, uh, this flight of the Wright brothers. And in 1909, uh, Blériot, again another alumnus from Ecole Centrale, uh, crossed the English Channel 
on uh, July 25, 1909, he was able to cross the channel in 35 minutes. And uh, he did that because at that time, the engines in France were twice <coughs> better than any other engines. They, they had the, a power per unit volume or a power per unit mass, which was twice as large as the, as the power of the competitors. And so he was the first to cross the English Channel. And that was, of course, a, a big event. He got the Daily Mail Prize. And uh, the crowd was around him and so on. He had, and afterwards, as an engineer, he built 10,000 aircraft. So uh, he became a, 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 a very, very important industry uh, person. And uh, this gave rise to what, what is now Airbus. In fact, the company he created uh, is continued now as Airbus. But of course, through many, many other names and through many other uh, fusions and merging and so on. All right, so what uh, I was telling you uh, about uh, aeronautics because I'm very interested in aeronautics propulsion. Uh, we, we work very much on uh, uh, combustion for aircraft engines and for spacecraft, for launchers. So uh, a lot of my work is motivated by the need for propulsion in aeronautics and space. Now, uh, what, what shall we do here? Uh, first of all, uh, it's a general introduction. So this is what I'm going to do, is give you a few of the topics that we want to look at, uh, use examples. Uh, the second one will be to give you some fundamental of acoustics, because as you will see, combustion dynamics is coupled by acoustic fields, by acoustic waves, acoustic modes. So it's important to learn about acoustics. So we'll do the equations here. Uh, we will then continue on acoustics of reactive flows and also uh, combustion noise, just to learn about how noise is created by flames. Afterwards, we will start on simple instability models, some theory. Uh, there is a framework which is unified to uh, look at uh, such problems and we will introduce that. Uh, there is a very old theory which was actually uh, developed, not only here, but, uh, uh, but uh, certainly here uh, by uh, Luigi Crocco. He was uh, a professor here and at that time, this was during the 1950s, there were many problems in rocket engine uh, instabilities, and uh, Luigi Crocco worked on that, and, uh, and he developed this sensitive time lag theory, which, which is quite interesting, and we will look at that. And afterwards, we will look at perturbed flames, what happens to flames when they are impinged by uh, perturbations, how do they respond, and this is an important aspect. Is it possible to represent that with transfer functions, describing functions? Uh, and uh, how, how can one do combustion control? So you will see there are methods, passive, active, dynamic. We'll describe that. Afterwards, uh, we will look at swirling flames because swirling flames are very important. You stabilize flames using swirl. And uh, the dynamics of such flames is interesting, so we we have a, a full chapter on that. And, uh, and then we will go to the uh, acoustics and the dynamics of annular systems. Systems uh, which comprise many injectors and which have an annular shape because typically uh, combustors in aircraft are uh, annular and in gas turbines that's the same and it's a good example on which we can look at the coupling between flames and azimuthal modes, modes which are, have a distribution of uh, pressure which has a, an azimuthal uh, component. So it's a, it's a very interesting uh, problem. Not too many experiments have been available here and we have one uh, which is quite interesting to look at and so we will spend some time on this. And, uh, then uh, I will tell you a little bit about the developments in 
what I call computational flame dynamics. It's not CFD uh, like uh, what you think. It's not computational fluid dynamics. It's computational flame dynamics. It's more complicated because you have the fluid, but in addition you have the flame. And how do we cope with that? And, uh, and this is, uh, there has been a, an enormous progress in this field. It's important for combustion dynamics. And then we will uh, look at uh, ignition problems because this is also a dynamical effect. And we will do some theory of it, about ignition. And then we will look at the ignition of uh, these uh, annular combustors. It's a critical moment. For example, suppose your engine stops, the combustor stops to burn for some reason, and you want to reignite, and you are at altitude, uh, are you able to reignite your engine? So ignition is maybe critical. Usually everything works well, uh, everything is smooth, but uh, if, you are, uh, if you are in the situation where you have to reignite, uh, you hope that it will. So uh, this is uh, the, the last topic that we'll cover. It's a lot of uh, things to do in 15 hours, but uh, there is a time. And of, of course, I would like to, to have questions. Don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, if you are not, if you don't understand something, uh, we can certainly uh, uh, answer to the questions. We hope we will be able to answer, but some questions are no, have no answer yet. So, uh, all right. So uh, the, the first is to give you this uh, introduction and um, with a few examples and uh, ask the question, why is combustion so susceptible to instabilities? Uh, classify combustion instabilities and, uh, and give you some objectives. All right, so uh, what we see here is that uh, the problems of uh, combustion uh, dynamics are found in many devices. Uh, it can be in your boiler, domestic boilers, it can be in process heaters that, use, that, are, that are used in industry. It can be in gas turbines because now the architecture of the combustor has changed. We want to diminish the nitric oxides and as a consequence, uh, we've, we've moved to, to have uh, premixed combustion and premixed combustion is more susceptible to instabilities. And uh, you also have uh, such uh, problems in big power plants. Uh, very often such plants have uh, resonances and they have uh, problems of instability. Let me show you one example, which is, uh, which is just a domestic boiler. So you see this device is just of that size. It's uh, a reasonable size. And uh, what we have here is a window which shows you the, the combustion uh, region. And, uh, and you see the, uh, what you will see now in the film is that the wall, due to oscillations of combustion, will actually uh, breeze. Uh, this will be, so, so the instability in, in this case is a coupling between the, uh, uh, the, the flame, the combustion, and, uh, and also the, the capacity of the wall to vibrate and to, uh, and to breeze. And, and this, is, uh, uh, this is interesting here. So do you see the wall uh, moving? You see it, it, it breezes. Do you see that? And uh, at the same time, you see that combustion is, uh, uh, the flame is uh, moving up and down and up and down. This is a slow uh, uh, motion of, of the film. The film, the, the, the vibration is at a higher frequency than that. So you see here already a, and of course there is some noise, but very low frequency noise. So this is a typical instability. Of course, you cannot live with something like that. So your domestic boiler doesn't have to have, uh, you cannot uh, have something of that, that kind uh, working in your house. So uh, if we now look at, uh, at uh, situations which are more industrial, like this one, uh, in gas turbines, uh, one of the, uh, the shift has been to go to uh, premixed combustion and uh, premixed combustion is more susceptible, uh, has a, uh, a higher propensity for uh, getting unstable. On the other hand, you know that premixed combustion is interesting because you can bring it in the lean, you can be operate in the lean mode, 
As a consequence, the temperature is not too high. It's just reasonable. And so the uh, nitric oxides do not grow, you know, that they grow exponentially with temperature. And here, uh, they will remain limited just because the, uh, uh, because the, uh, you, you can bring the temperature at the, the right level. You don't have stoichiometric uh, regions in your flame. They are, it's premixed, it's lean. So premixed combustion is, of course, very interesting, but it has this problem of, in of instabilities. Another area where combustion instabilities have had uh, uh, a very detrimental effects is rocket engines. You see one engine here after uh, such a high frequency instability in the, in the chamber, and this has uh, uh, very destructive effects. This is the, 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 the worst case. It's, uh, it doesn't happen too often, fortunately. Uh, when, I, when I was um, about, uh, well, I started working, I was at Honor as an engineer, and uh, at that time, we launched the first Ariane rocket, and it was a success. And three months later, we launched a second Ariane rocket, and it was a failure because of uh, high frequency instability. That took place in May or, or June of uh, 1981, and I was part of the, of the panel that examined this uh, instability. So, uh, you'll be better yeah, in the, at, the, at the higher level, yeah. please. So, uh, so uh, such uh, high frequency instabilities in rocket engines have always been a problem. Uh, we, we know how to control them. We, we are much better off now, but it's still uh, something that, uh, that we continue to study and, uh, and of course we want to control. All right, second, uh, so, so again, in the, in the area of uh, combustion uh, in, uh, um, in, in gas turbines, uh, the problem is complicated because you see here, for example, one of these combustors, it's in the Rolls-Royce engine, and you have uh, the complexity. Yes, thank you, that's very nice. Oh, it's, it's okay. Uh, you have the complexity of, uh, of the flow, so uh, the injection is here, on the upstream side, you have the compressor. On the downstream, you have the turbine. And so the flow here is premixed, essentially premixed. Uh, and uh, it's swirling, so the stabilization is made by swirl. And afterwards, the gases flow into the turbine here. So the, one of the complexity here is the, the geometry. The flow is uh, swirling, it's turbulent, it's premixed. You have the, the reaction taking place. So everything is complicated here. We don't have a liquid phase. It's just uh, gas, it's methane or natural gas and the air, but still it's a complex problem. And uh, the boundary conditions are complex. You have to describe what happens uh, uh, when waves are reflected by the compressor or by the turbine, what happens there. Uh, so what we, what we say here again is that such problems of course, need to be studied using numerical techniques. It's uh, very difficult. Of course, you can do a lot using analysis, but still, if you want to, to calculate, to predict, you need uh, computational techniques, and they are based on larger eddy simulation. So uh, to look at such uh, problems, you need all these tools. Uh, of course, you need the acoustics. You, you have to look at the dynamics of the various components the compressor and the turbine, and you also need to, to, to represent everything using, uh, using uh, uh, numerical methods. So uh, just, uh, just to go a little further, uh, what is uh, needed here is to be able to represent the effects of perturbations, for example, velocity fluctuations. What do they do to the flow what happens to the heat release here, and uh, what kind of pressure fluctuations come out of here. You also produce entropy waves right here. This goes in the combustion chamber, uh, produces, you have these pressure fluctuations. This may, may, uh, may have act on the air and fuel supply, so there is the impedance of the injector which comes in, into the picture, and this is a loop, and so this what we have to represent is something of that kind. 
another way of looking at uh, the processes. Oh, let me show uh, again a, a situation here. Uh, this is a swirling flame, and uh, it's in the um, it's in the uh, it's in a box. The swirler is on the on the right, and the flow goes to the left. And what we will see is that as we change progressively the the equivalence ratio, this is premix combustion. It's swirled. Uh, at one point, the flame will change, and uh, the system becomes unstable. And I'll try to have the noise also coming out of the computer. So let's let's stop this film. This is a, a facility in our lab. Do you hear that? So, so uh, this is what you see in the lab when you have a, sim a single injector, a situation where when you change one of the parameters, in this case it's the equivalence ratio, and you move from a stable regime. It wasn't too stable. It's, uh, the flame was not quite uh, stable, but uh, basically the noise level was rather low, and you move to a, a above a certain critical value, and you become, become unstable, and there you have an oscillation. Of course, there is noise, but there is a, a definite uh, oscillation. So there is a coupling between the acoustics of this system and the combustion. And this is what we want to study. And uh, the effect is that it, it uh, produces vibrations. It intensifies the uh, uh, it, it intensifies the uh, the heat re uh, the the heat load to the walls, and uh, it may have destructive effects. You don't want that uh, in, under a, a normal uh, operation. So the, the mechanism is the flow is perturbed. It perturbs combustion. Combustion produces heat release fluctuations. And this gives pressure fluctuations, which synchronize the flow. And uh, under certain conditions, if the gain is sufficient, if the gain is uh, uh, above the damping, uh, if the frequency is right, if the delays are correct, uh, then the system becomes unstable. Another view, uh, in, in fact, this black box, these boxes uh, uh, represent much more complicated phenomena. For example, you have here uh, all the upstream dynamics of the feeding lines, of the impedance conditions. Uh, then you have injection, mixing, atomization, vaporization, if you have a, a liquid injection. Uh, Stabilization is also uh, a problem here, the flame holding. Uh, this will produce heat release. You have flame wall interactions. Uh, you may have organized vortices that occur. Uh, this will produce also entropy waves. These entropy waves will interact with the exhaust boundary conditions, and this will give acoustics back. And uh, these are the processes that are hidden behind this very simple loop. So we have to account for all that. And of course, what we are going to do is to look at uh, these uh, various uh, situations. Uh, let me uh, go to the next slide. One of, one, of the, uh, one of the systems, which is simplest, which you can uh, bring in, in the, uh, in directly in the, an amphitheater to show that, I haven't done that because you have to take a flight and so on, but it's, uh, it's simple to, to build in your garage. Uh, you have a few pipes here, and you use a soldering uh, uh, flame here, and you can introduce just the flame in the pipe, and this becomes immediately unstable. Uh, how is it called? This is called the Rico tube. This is, uh, the name is the Rico tube. It's, uh, it's uh, the simplest situation of resonant uh, dynamics. Uh, it's, a, it's a very simple thing to demonstrate. I have a film, but I will show it uh, just at the end of this uh, slides. So uh, uh, remember that we have to look at this film. All right, so uh, another case, well, when we started working on this in this area, uh, one of our experiments that was done with Thierry Poinceau 
looked like that. We had here air and propane premixed, five uh, injection channels. And uh, at the time, we had a very small window, which is just this size, this window right here. And uh, on the stable operation, uh, this is how the, the, uh, the flow looks like. So basically, you have regions of, uh, of reaction here. Uh, they are limited by the window. You cannot see the other regions. And, uh, and the black regions are the recirculation behind these steps. Uh, under unstable operation, this is how the, the combustor looks like. So this was uh, one of our early paper in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics. And, uh, and so the, the question was, what, what, is the, what happens here? And what we found is by using Schlieren images, uh, we could see the following. Whoops. So what we see here, you see the, there are vortices which are formed uh, cyclically, and these vortices interact. And uh, we were able, so this was uh, in the 1980s. At that time, you didn't have uh, cameras to look at uh, digital cameras that were not existing. So what we did was to take a photomultiplier and displace the photomultiplier uh, uh, on a predetermined scanning uh, grid and take uh, the signals at each point and then synchronize everything by the phase of the oscillation and get the image here. That was a lot of work, you know, to just get one, one of these pictures that you can now can get with, a, with a, a simple camera, a digital camera. And what we see is that as the vortices interact, they produce a pulse of uh, heat release. And this, this is the pulse that is produced by the interaction here. So basically, uh, we were able to understand the mechanism. The mechanism is vortex shedding by this, uh, uh, this, the formation of these vortices, and later their interaction and sudden uh, uh, production of a heat release pulse. And uh, later on, uh, uh, we started doing calculations, LES calculations. These are some of the early calculations of this process. You can see that you can form these vortices. Again, here, that was just a single vortex and constrained between walls. It's not yet the full uh, scale. That was in the years uh, 2001 or something like that. We started being able, capable of calculating these vortices at the frequency of 530 hertz. So uh, of course, what we, what we want to do is to have experiments, but at the same time, develop the, uh, the theory and the calculations. And this just shows a comparison. Of course, it's, it's not yet the, uh, the full system. It was also two-dimensional. No, uh, in those days, you couldn't uh, afford to, to do three-dimensional calculations. Now, uh, the, uh, such a system is uh, can be calculated. It's, uh, it's now possible to actually calculate uh, systems of that kind. So you see there is a resemblance. It's not quite, doesn't look exactly like this, but uh, has, a, has the features that you see here. They are here. And, of course, it's still crude. It's still a crude, but nevertheless, at the time, we, we were very happy to, to have such a result. Another uh, early experiment was done on this, on this device. This device is a, you have a flame which is stabilized on a flame holder. You see the, it's a, it's a gutter, it's a V gutter. This is what is used in, uh, in the afterburners of aircraft engines essentially military engines. Uh, you, you have a, uh, an obstacle. The flow is coming from the right, from, from the left, sorry. And it's air and propane in this case. And on the stable operation, you have a flame which develops and uh, reaches the wall. And this is why you have more luminosity here. And uh, actually, the, the flame is, is continuing outside the channel here. This is the box and you, you still you have an open uh, atmosphere. And the, the topic was to use two driver units, two loudspeakers, and inject acoustic waves and look at the, at the flame, what happens to, to the flame under these conditions for various frequencies. And what was noticed is that, you see, when, 
when there is no, uh, no waves, well, the flame is developing as a turbulent flame right here. And when you put in flames, uh, waves, acoustic waves, well, the flame responds very much, you know, the, and uh, over a, a very broad range of frequencies. So the, the flames are susceptible to perturbations. They are immediately perturbed by, by the acoustic waves. And, and you, you can, of course, this changes as you increase the frequency, the, the wavelength changes. And uh, for example, here it's a modulation of uh, about 1000 Hertz. And uh, again, around this uh, era, uh, these years, we, we started calculating such situations and you can more or less represent what is seen here, you can see. Again, that was a two-dimensional calculation, but already in the LES framework. So you, you can see that uh, uh, such situations, uh, perturbed flames can be actually modeled, calculated, using numerical techniques. Uh, so again, what, what we want to do is to study the flow, combustion, acoustics, and this loop is the, the main loop that we want to look at. So we want to study the, 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 uh, what happens to the flow when, when there, are, there are acoustic waves here, what happens to combustion when these acoustic waves impinge on the flame, and what sort of acoustics are being produced by that. So this is the loop that we want to study. So now, why is combustion so, uh, so susceptible to instabilities? So uh, one, uh, one answer is that even a, a rather large pressure fluctuation corresponds to fairly small power level. Uh, let's take, for example, this engine. This is a, a rocket engine which equips the Ariane 5 rocket. It's the Vulcan engine. The power level is 2.5 gigawatts. So that's pretty big. Two, two gigawatts is a uh, gigawatt. It's uh, like a power plant. One, one gigawatt is a power plant. It's a nuclear power plant. It's a one, one, one gigawatt. And, uh, and, and, and the volume of the chamber is very small. It's uh, 50 liters. As a consequence, you have here a power level of 50 gigawatts per cubic meter, a very big uh, uh, power density. The highest power densities that we have uh, are, are chemical. Uh, this takes place at 100 bars. So you are at high pressure and you have a very, very, very dense uh, power. And now if you assume that you have a pressure fluctuation of two megapascals, 20 atmospheres, 20 bars, you can calculate the acoustic power of that per unit uh, volume, and it's typically of the order of 0.4 megawatts. So you see the, uh, the amount of power that is associated with a very large, the uh, 20 bar, uh, the fluctuation is enormous. You know, it's a fluctuation at a, at a frequency, let's say of uh, 1000 Hertz or something like that, uh, 20 bars, and nevertheless, the acoustic power is not very large. So the, the, you, you don't need much uh, acoustic power to have a, something which is uh, very powerful. So, and you have a lot of, uh, of power available. The power available is big. And so a small amount organized by acoustics may be sufficient to have these uh, instabilities. So, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing in a, in, in a sense. Uh, I'm not saying that the Ariane rocket uh, engine is unstable. I'm just giving an, uh, uh, the, the levels. I'm, I'm not, uh, the rocket works well and the last uh, launch was fine. Everything was well. Uh, a second uh, reason for, uh, for, for this uh, uh, thing is, is to take uh, this equation. And this is a more theoretical uh, uh, argument. Let's assume that we have uh, this second order differential equation. This is a damping term. This is the second order term. And let's have a, a, a system here. But you see, x now depends on t minus tau. So there is a delay. So if you have a system with a delay, this can be very unstable. 
the, the standard experience is your shower. If you take a shower in the morning and you have a long, uh, uh, a long uh, pipe between your uh, taps and between the, the shower, you can become unstable because the shower is cold. You push the tap so that it may, it's warmer, but you push it too much to the warm side and uh, suddenly it becomes terribly hot. So then uh, your reaction is to bring it back to, to cold, but uh, you, you, do, you do it uh, again, there is a delay and you do it too much and everything becomes very cold and suddenly you're, you're really cold. And so uh, uh, systems with delay are unstable. And how, how can you see that? Well, the idea is just to, you see the, the equation is uh, d2 acts by dt squared. You have this damping term, dx by dt. You can imagine that x is the pressure, for example. And let's assume that this term here uh, is, corresponds to t minus tau. And now what we can do if, if tau, if the delay is not too large, we can say x of t minus tau can be extend, expanded around t. And you can write that down minus tau dx by dt. And so this equation becomes d2x by dt squared plus 2 zeta. So this is a, a, a real damping. But on the other hand, uh, you will have, let's, let's write it like that, 2 zeta minus um, tau omega 0 and uh, omega 0 dx by dt plus omega zero square x of t. And you see that if, um, if tau omega zero is greater than two zeta, this becomes unstable. You know that the solution of that equation is uh, x of t is like e to the minus, uh, minus uh, zeta minus um, um, uh, omega zero tau omega zero t. So if this becomes negative, divided by two here. Yeah. If this is negative, uh, this becomes exponentially uh, large. So that's a simple method to show that uh, systems with delays can be unstable. So one of the big uh, problem in combustion is that you have delays. Uh, for example, you inject uh, a, um, a fuel, you inject something that, that's going to burn and it will burn after a, a certain while. So you, you become unstable because of that. All right, let's continue. Uh, this, this idea that the, uh, the, 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 the delay is important was uh, immediate in the early work on combustion dynamics. So you see here Luigi Crocco. He was a professor here in Princeton. Uh, he led a group uh, working on combustion instabilities. He was a, a very well-known professor in, uh, in uh, influent mechanics, uh, very famous. There is a seminar uh, given every year, I guess, on, uh, uh, in the name of Crocco here in Princeton. And, uh, now, his wife uh, loved Paris. She wanted to, to be in Paris. So finally, he resigned from Princeton and came to France. And uh, there, there is where he, he, uh, he finished his life. And, uh, and he was a professor for some time at Ecole Centrale, a, a part-time professor. Another person of, uh, of uh, big fame is uh, Tien. Tien was a professor at uh, Caltech. And, uh, and later on, he became the father of China's uh, space program. Uh, he left uh, the United States because uh, of uh, political uh, problems uh, during the McCarthy area, uh, era. And, uh, and he continued in China. And, and he's uh, also one of the fathers of this uh, uh, sensitive time lag theory. 
And my own advisor, Frank Marble, also was working in this field and used this theory. And uh, yeah. So, so the, uh, the, the idea is the following. The, the time lag itself is not constant, but depends on the parameters. So it, uh, and the, the rule that, that they were using and that we are going to examine is this one. Tau depends on an interaction index and it depends on the pressure with a certain time lag and the pressure at, at, the, at the moment. And you have this rule and this can be used to model combustion instability. So we'll take a look at that later on. Uh, Another aspect of the problem is that combustors are resonant. They, they, have a, uh, they have the capacity to resonate. They are confined and as a consequence, you can have various modes developing in combustors. Uh, you can have uh, modes which are longitudinal, uh, like that. Uh, so when the wavelength is very large compared to the diameter of the system, and uh, if the frequency is higher, the wavelengths become smaller than the diameter of the system, and you can have azimuthal situations, especially in rocket engines or in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, combustors, in aircraft engines or in gas turbines, this may happen. And, uh, and, and so the, the coupling may, may be through transverse modes. So you, you may have these various possibilities. So this led uh, uh, Barrère, Marcel Barrère was a pioneer in rocket engines in France and uh, also uh, Foreman Williams. Uh, they, uh, they, they produced a paper where they classified the instabilities. One of, uh, some of them are system instabilities. They involve the whole system from the entrance to the exhaust of the, of the system. Uh, then you have chamber instabilities which are coupled by modes inside the chamber. And then you may have uh, what is called intrinsic instabilities. Uh, intrinsic inst instabilities are instabilities that don't need the acoustics. They can be produced by the flame itself. So we have uh, the very famous hydrodynamic instability, which is uh, associated with the names of uh, Landau and Darius. You see these two people. Landau, a very famous Russian physicist, and Darius, Georges Darius, who happens to be, again, a, uh, an alumnus from Ecole Centrale. It's amazing. And in 1968, he came to, our, to the school to give a seminar. He was very old. And he gave us a seminar on the relativistic traveler. And I met Darius. I'm perhaps the only one who have met in the, in the combustion community. But this is the Darius Landau instability. Darius published that in a, in a journal which nobody reads, while Landau published that in, a, in something which was more accessible. But basically, uh, the two of them arrived to the same uh, conclusion that the uh, flames, premixed flames, are unstable, uh, intrinsically unstable. So we, the, there is this variety of instabilities which are associated just with flames. Um, let me see, we, ha we are supposed to stop at one point. What, at what time uh, are we supposed to stop? Do you know that? 9.45. 9.45, so I have a few more minutes. Thank you, thanks. All right, uh, this is just to show a timeline, but of course there are many more. Uh, I, I just put a, a few photographs of people but many more uh, can be placed on this uh, diagram. It's uh, just a, a few people who have contributed to uh, this field. Uh, and uh, just to show how uh, we, essentially the, in the beginning, uh, of course the diagnostics were not very, uh, what, what we have now. They, it was much more difficult to make, uh, everything was more difficult, um, putting a, a probe, a pressure probe was already difficult. Uh, the signals were only, you didn't have computers, so everything had to be done in an analog way. Uh, you, you had electronics and you could, spectral analysis, for example, was done. I, I did it like that when I was very young. We used a, uh, 
a, a, a spectral analyzer from Hewlett Packard, and it was purely analogic. You know, everything was difficult to plot. Something was very difficult, and nevertheless, they they were able to do experiments which provided the basic understanding of these instabilities, uh, and also some theory, a lot of theory. And there was a uh, in the 1970s there was a very big report um, uh, from NASA. The NASA once uh, uh, well, a NASA report which. Uh, compiled all the effort that was done on rocket engines. And, um, and then uh, a lot of experiments started at the end of the 1970s and 1980s to just look at the details of what happens in combustors under instability. And that was very useful. And this has continued. Uh, a lot of uh, experiments give you the, the physical understanding. What are the mechanisms which are at hand? I've shown a few uh, in the, uh, previously. And afterwards, uh, now we are, uh, we've, de we've been developing a lot for numerical modeling. Uh, a lot has been done to do active control, uh, to control uh, such uh, flames and, uh, and use concepts where you, you uh, counteract the, uh, the development of the instability. And, uh, and we use a lot of LES now, and we study also this azimuthal coupling, so with all these tools. And, uh, and so now we have uh, really uh, many capacities. We understand much more of the physics, or we know much more about the theory. We have diagnostics, which are much more elaborate, and we can do calculations. So all of that uh, has improved the, the situation very much. And so the, uh, the objective is to identify the mechanisms, illustrate these mechanisms by experiments, and they will also serve to validate predictions, uh, derive theoretical modeling tools to analyze combustion dynamics, and provide fundamental elements for the prediction. Uh, first of all, of linear situations, that is, uh, but uh, there are many nonlinear features that are very important, and we have also things on that side. All right, so let's stop this one. And let me show you the, uh, the, the film. So you see, uh, I, I don't know if you, are you using VLC? VLC, this uh, uh, for uh, films or, well, VLC was created at Ecole Centrale. It's students, it, it's not in our lab, unfortunately, but uh, students from our school created VLC and supporting VLC. So VLC is, uh, is helping me here. Let me show you this film. So this is the organ pipe. So Daniel Durox is, uh, is my colleague at Ecole Centrale and we work together very much. So you see the, uh, the pipes here. So what you see here is what happens to the flame uh, using uh, just high speed, uh, a high speed camera. And if the, the burner is higher in the pipe, you can see the a small vortex uh, structure developing at the end of the flame. So th that's a simple experiment. You see, you can really reproduce that uh, in your garage. You can also uh, make a lecture when you have a lecture. It's nicer to, to see it here, but here you have the film. So uh, that's uh, the so-called Rico tube. Oh, it starts again. All right, let's stop that. All right, uh, so uh, a few more minutes. Let's go to the next. Uh... So, uh, now we are going to start again, 
and uh, and the objective is to is to look at uh, at the acoustics. Uh, you've seen acoustics is very important. We have to learn how to use acoustics. Who has done some acoustics in? Who has a background in acoustics? Raise your hands. One, two, three. Yeah. But so what I'm going to do is give you a good background in acoustics. So uh, I'll try to at least. That, that's the objective. Uh, because we have to learn about the acoustic waves. They they are uh, they are coupling everything here. So uh, we will see the basic equations of acoustics. Uh, we will look at plane waves in one dimension because many situations are in ducts. You have ducts or things which are longitudinal and the wavelength is large compared to the diameter. So we have to look at the acoustics of such systems. We will look at harmonic waves because at resonance you are at a given frequency. Resonance is very important for engineering. Uh, you try to escape resonance in most cases. You don't want to have something resonating. Uh, we will look at plane modes in ducts and we will look at uh, uh, a little bit of harmonic waves, uh, uh, spherical harmonic waves and the, the acoustic energy balance. So the assumptions first are to uh, forget about combustion, forget about uh, the complexities that we have to cope with and just look at the acoustics without any, any combustion. So the, uh, we, we assume that the thermodynamic state is determined by two variables, two thermodynamic variables. Basically, we assume that the pressure in the system will be just a function of the density and the entropy. This is convenient. Uh, of course, we also use the, the standard temperature and so on. For example, for a perfect gas, we know that the pressure is equal to rho RT. And uh, to write that, we can write P is equal to rho gamma E to S over CV. CV is the uh, uh, specific heat per unit mass. Uh, CV itself is given by R over gamma minus one. Uh, gamma is, uh, is equal to Cp over Cv. And, uh, and we have also, um, uh, yes, and R itself is equal to the, the gas constant, the universal gas constant divided by the, the molar mass. So, uh, so we assume that uh, the pressure is just depending on these two quantity. Uh, we assume that the fluid is ideal. There is no viscosity, no conductivity. Of course there is, but uh, if you are in the low frequency range, uh, these effects are very small on acoustic waves. So they can be neglected if you are in small systems or if you are in the low frequency range. If you go to high frequency in the ultrasonic range, you have to take into account this, uh, but this is far beyond what we, what we are doing here. No chemical reactions, no, uh, no uh, volume, uh, volume uh, forces, uh, no uh, addition of mass and heat. So the basic equations that we are going to start with are the Euler equations. Uh, you recognize the, the equation, the, the balance of mass, d rho by dt, plus divergence of rho v. And uh, the balance of momentum that can be written with the material derivative dv by dt plus v scalar v grad v is equal to minus grad p. Of course, if the fluid, uh, if, if you had the volume forces, we would have additional terms. Let me just put these terms. Rho G, this would be the, the volumetric forces. And we would have also a term corresponding to the viscous stresses, uh, which is the divergence of the visc viscous stress tensor. But these two terms we neglect. And, uh, and the third equation is written here it, it's convenient to write something for the entropy. 
This is not so usual. You see the, uh, whoops. It says that the entropy, there is no term on the right-hand side here. There is, uh, nothing is changing the entropy. The entropy is constant on the, on the, uh, on the streamline. And uh, what are the terms if, if we, we had conductivity and, uh, and, um, and, and viscous uh, stresses? Instead, we would have here uh, tau, double scalar product of V minus divergence of Q. But again, we, we consider that there is no uh, conduction and that these two terms are very small. So as a consequence, we have zero here. Uh, of course, I'm not sure you've seen this equation like that. Uh, I think I can show you how, how it comes from very rapidly, but then you can work it out uh, as a homework. You can try to do that. You see the energy equation is written here at the bottom. Uh, where did I put the, yeah. You see this, this is the energy equation when you have a volume source, a volume force, this is the power of the volume forces. Uh, you have a term which correspond to the pressure. This will remain. This one is, uh, corresponds to the uh, um, viscous stresses and this is the heat release, the, the, uh, the heat conduction. Uh, now, this equation can be uh, transformed as follows. First of all, you, you write down an equation for the kinetic energy. Th this is just to tell you that the last equation, the entropy equation, will come out from that. So you, you take this equation and you, you subtract an equation for the uh, kinet kinetic energy. And you see that some terms go away. For example, this goes away, this combines with this one, this combines with that one, and you get this term here. And now you take this equation and transform it into enthalpy. You, you know that E is equal to H minus P over rho, and so you, you get an equation for the ent uh, enthalpy. And you use dH is equal to TDS plus one over rho dP. This is a GIPS. Uh, equation. Uh, and when you do that, you get this equation for the entropy. And if this is zero and that is zero, you get exactly what I've shown here. So that was just to tell you it's possible to get this last equation if you are not persuaded by that. You, you've seen the reasoning. It's, it's a little bit fast, but you can do it by yourself. It's, uh, you have to use this uh, uh, vector analysis uh, devices and you, you get to this set of equations. These are much simpler. We will study that uh, after the break. So come back here at 10, 10 o'clock. Yeah, I have a few minutes late, three minutes late, but still come back at 10.